Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, great to see you. Um, so Dan and I, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Dan and I play squash on a not infrequent basis, but this is the first time we've ever presented together, so there you go. Um, so uh, here's the plan for today, and I hope to make this pretty interactive. Um, and actually, I'm not going to talk about any of my own research. Uh, Dan will talk about some of his own. Uh, but I wanted to just um, talk to you about a particular area of research called health services and policy research. So, because I do think a lot of times people think of research as, you know, being in a lab, <coughs> text to mice, rats, guinea pigs, etc. And I just want to introduce you to another kind of uh, research. Um, and then I'm going to get you uh, to tell me about some health services and policy projects you think need to be done in Toronto on the basis of you or your parents or your siblings' experiences with healthcare in this province. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes doing that. I'll briefly uh, tell you about an institute that I used to be the CEO of uh, called the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. We used to always call it ISIS, but now there's another ISIS that most people think of. And so you get funny looks when you say I'm the former CEO of ISIS to people at the cocktail party. Uh, so uh, we now call it uh, ICS or the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who, um, you know, um, I think the, when I was trying to think of a general topic that might be of interest uh, to uh, particularly younger folks, um, my wife and I took our two kids to Switzerland. My mom's from Switzerland this summer. And then the last night in Switzerland, we were sitting down for dinner, and my son came down, and he looked ashen and uh, said, what's up? And he said, geez, just on my Facebook page, I kind of did a guy that I just hung around with a lot in university, like I knew him pretty well. and. He was just found dead of an opioid overdose in the apartment of his uh, house uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning downtown Toronto. Uh, you know, it's an, it's an issue that's uh, affecting uh, many of us, and I think many of us actually know a lot of people uh, who've been affected by this. So I thought, in terms of using an actual example, Dan's worked a lot uh, in Canada and internationally around opioid and, and, and narcotic policy and drug policy. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Dan uh, for that part. Um, so, I, so basically, like I think of health services research, at least in Canada, or what I do, is try to like understand and describe how the healthcare system works, and then ask like, what's it doing well, what's it not doing so well, and then how can we make it work better? That's kind of more or less it. Uh, there's a couple more sophisticated um, uh, definitions I'll just give you. You know, it's research designed to improve the way healthcare services are organized, you know, the way doctors work, the way doctors work with nurses, the way hospitals work with the community, how health services, or, uh, services are organized, regulated, managed, financed, used and delivered in the interest of improving the health and quality of life of all Canadians. So you can imagine that in health service research, Dan and I work with economists. Uh, we work with uh, people that understand behavioral psychology because, you know, in terms of getting people to change how they practice is, is not easy. So it's a, a very, uh, and obviously we work with a lot of epidemiologists and statisticians, it's a very uh, complex sort of research area. And here's just another one, uh, health services research studies how social factors, so just to make the point that uh, you know, I think 80% of the men's homeless shelters in Toronto are within about two kilometers of where, or many of them are within two kilometers of where we are. Uh, the social impact of poverty is huge. Uh, not just in terms of uh, education, but huge in terms of health. Uh, so you can't understand actually health and optimize health without focusing on some of the non-health care issues like education, like poverty. Uh, so it focuses on social factors, financing systems, organizational structures, etc. Um, and in the end it sort of says its research domains are individuals, families, organizations, institutions, communities, and populations. Uh, so again, just to make the point that we focus on, a, it's, a, it's in some ways a sort of overwhelming uh, area of research. And so just, um, and just to, to, to say that Health service and policy research is focused on not what's happening theoretically, but like how is healthcare delivered now? And how could we improve it in the future? It's very difficult to do controlled experiments. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to get politicians to say, yeah, 
will randomize certain regions of the province to have one particular health policy and another to another. It's not impossible, but uh, it, it, it's hard. And it invariably involves people other than scientists. So we're not going to our lab where we have total control over things. Uh, we have to work with, and we usually enjoy working with, uh, people who are managers in the system, doctors, nurses, policy makers, and patients. Uh, as well as a scientist. So it's a truly multidisciplinary area. And, um, you know, sometimes we like it, sometimes we don't. Um, the research that we have, do has political implications. Dan May talked to you about the work he did in Vancouver on the safe injection site. There's some people that have very visceral political reactions to having a safe injection site in their community. Um, but, you know, those are things that we have to address on a policy level. Uh, but also on a research level. So I guess just to sort of ask, there, there's no right or wrong answer here, but just, you know, most of you are young, so most of you probably haven't used the healthcare system a hell of a lot yourselves. Um, some of you have. Uh, but all of you have got, uh, you know, parents, grandparents, relatives, friends. Um, based on your experience, what do you think some of the problem, and the reason I'm asking this is once we identify a few of the problems, we can sort of ask, well, what, could, what kind of research would we do to address that problem? So, anybody? What, some, just, some issues that you, yep? Um, starting the diagnostic, or getting into the diagnosis for the care, like right. your triage, right. it can be great, yep. but getting to the point where you would be put into that triage system can be very long and problematic. So, so this diagnosis. Okay. So you're saying, um, can you give a specific example of a, not wanting to put you on the spot if you don't want to, that's fine. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, example for that. Yeah. I actually, I would say it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, like I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Right. And so that was like a really long process. It was like right. yeah. five months before they even got me to the test that discovered the issue. Okay. And sort of like moving up that chain was like a really tough time and I was trying to go through right. school with it as well. So. Yeah, that sort of process, like once you get there, then the treatment's good, like I was dealt with well and like yep. anything else, but just, yeah, getting to that point was yeah. a challenge. Cancer so thanks for sharing that. Cancer diagnosis. Cancer diagnosis. Yep. Someone comes yep. up with a general problem and yep. it takes a long time to get the tests. So let me just uh, make a comment on that and then I'll bet. So, you know, as a researcher, I'm sitting there, I'm standing here, um, sort of thinking, um, so, like we would call some of this access to care. So there's issues around getting access to the, in your case, the, the specialist. Uh, and, and you didn't show up with a, like a, a stamp on your head saying rheumatoid arthritis. You showed up with, and I don't want to get into it, but either tiredness or pain or fatigue or whatever. And um, <coughs> so the health care, the folks seeing you in the healthcare system has got to First of all, make the right diagnosis, and then once the right diagnosis is made, you know, either treat you in primary care, or if primary care is not going to be able to treat you well, then move you on to specialty care, right? And similarly around cancer diagnosis, like within the cancer system, uh, one of the big, like people that present with lung cancer, often they're sort of, you know, you see, for some reason they have a chest x-ray and they have a small little lesion on their chest x-ray, which could be a lung cancer, it could be something totally not a problem, and patients often wait forever uh, to have those things biopsied. And so one of the things the cancer system has done is set up special clinics that are just set up uh, for people that have those kind of abnormalities on their chest x-ray. And you know they'll have the radiologist, they'll have the surgeon, they'll have the person doing the biopsy all there to see the patient at the same time. So that, you know, that, and, and a lot of that actually has been those interventions or those changes in the system uh, have been influenced by research that's been done. And then you want to do some research to say, like, did this new way of managing these people really make a difference or not? Uh, so, yes, you had a. I was going to say that there's no continuity in information sharing. So, yep. from a patient perspective, having to explain your circumstances over and over and over and Yep. Um, dealing with so many different people, it, it, it's very difficult and there's no patient advocacy 
um, for people that you know are having issues. Maybe it's a concussion or a brain injury, and yeah, it, it comes down to the family trying to help them navigate this very convoluted system. Yeah, so uh, I would agree with you 100%. Uh, I chair the board of um, Health uh, Quality Ontario, and we had a um, just this remarkable guy. Drew, I think he's 28 now. He um, was on uh, in Peru and was hit by a rogue, rogue wave and it broke his neck and he's been paralyzed since then on a ventilator. And he talked to us about, um, you know, in the same ICU, and he was in the same, he's at home now actually, and, uh, but in the same ICU that he was in initially for the first year and a half after the accident, the number of times he had to repeat his exact same story to the residents uh, over and over and over again. And as a patient, he was thinking like, like, can't you folks just kind of set some system up where I don't have to do this all the time? Now, I guess it's an interesting question. Is that a research question or is that just something that we're being so freaking stupid in the healthcare system and we're not doing what we should be doing, right? So there's sometimes that too. But then the continuity of care. I mean, my mom's 92 and she's modestly demented. Like if I wasn't a doc sort of advocating for her and helping her around, she'd have a lot of trouble. Uh, and so uh, this whole transitions of care, communication, et cetera, is a huge deal in the healthcare system. And there is a role of research to sort of say, what's the best way of setting this up, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah. Any other, well, just for time, just do one or two others. Anybody? Yep. Oh, hang on. No, we need, we, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll go elsewhere. Any other? Yep. I would, I think maybe just tied to sort of like the social aspects in terms of the stigma. So for example, mental health issues, people not might or may not seek out uh, treatment right. or care just because of the stigma that surrounds mental health and addiction. So I guess yeah. that touches your uh, sort of behavioral psychology that right. you spoke about earlier. Yeah. And again, uh, I think, uh, you know, we have, what, what's the name? I've just had a blank, the uh, Olympic, um, Canada's one of the most uh, decorated, Claire Hughes, right? And her, and Ken H, I think, has been terrific at, first of all, just trying to, and others obviously, but trying to just decrease the stigma around mental health. But, um, um, you know, I think uh, there's huge issues in mental health management in our system whereby even, even if we got rid of the stigma, and when we do get rid of the stigma, we actually don't have appropriate resources to then actually help manage those people that are finally willing to uh, come forward and say, yeah, I have problems with depression or anxiety or whatever. So, and so I just wanted to very briefly, before I turn it over to Dan, introduce you to ISIS, so the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. This is a snapshot of their, or screenshot of their website. I don't know why, but there's other stuff on the website that's just sort of blank. But, uh, and you can see actually their kind of tagline there is research excellence for better policy, stronger healthcare, and healthier people. Basically, ISIS, has been in existence since 1992. And within ISIS, they hold a massive amount of data that is anonymized. But if any of you have seen your family doctor or a specialist, like just not to pick on you, but your room yourself, you're in there. Um, so that um, you're in there anonymized, I wouldn't be able to find you. But um, like, Every time a patient is admitted to hospital in Ontario, the hospital has to fill out a record when the patient is discharged. That's actually sent up to ISIS. With, you know, what was the re when were they admitted, what was the diagnosis, when they were discharged. Every visit to a fee-for-service doctor. Uh, when I bill, or when Ori and I bill the government for our visit, we have to put in who the person was, what the diagnosis was, that's in ISIS. The drugs that are paid for, so people over 65 have their drugs paid for by the government, okay, that's in ISIS. So to go on and on and on, and what makes ISIS unbelievably powerful is that all of those data are linked. So to use my mom as an example, we used to live in Ottawa, and when she was in Ottawa, she got breast cancer. And she had a lumpectomy, and then a year and a half later, her breast cancer came back, and she had her breast removed. Um, and then she had some, she was over 65 at the time, she had some chemotherapy. So the fact that she went into the hospital to have a lumpectomy, the fact that she had breast cancer would have been on the cancer registry. But the link part means that researchers can see that my mom actually had a second recur had a recurrence. 
and actually had a um, breast cancer, and actually can tell that she's still alive because she doesn't show up on the death registry. So you can actually follow patients and how they're managed across, um, you know, I had my mom had a heart attack, that would be in there too. So it's not just within diseases. And you can do some really, really powerful research using those linked data to see how the system is working across the whole province. And so, this is my last slide before I turn it over to Dan. I just looked at the media release section of ISIS this morning, and I just picked like four of the sort of studies that they have released uh, this year. So, actually, the first one uh, comes out of St. Michael's. So, it, the title really was There are large gaps, and you probably know that anybody over 50 should have a screen for colon cancer because uh, it's one of the very good evidence that if you collect. Uh, pick it early, uh, you'll, you'll you know, cure the cancer and actually you'll extend uh, life expectancy. And uh, the title is Large Gaps in Colon Cancer Screening Rates in Ontario Immigrants versus Wealthier Long-Term Residents. So using ISIS data, they were able to determine they have an immigrant database. They were able to tell on average, like I live in Leaside, fairly wealthy. There's a couple poor people in our neighborhood, but not many. Uh, so based on my postal code, they can characterize the wealth of my neighborhood. Uh, the postal code near Seton House here, not a lot of rich people around there. Um, so you can actually look at social economic status and find there, when I looked at the paper, there are huge differences in the likelihood that someone's poor in this province is gonna be screened for cancer, colon cancer or not. I was a policymaker, that's a big deal. Uh, so that should be influencing policy. They found another study was that access to family doctors varies widely across the, the, the province. And it probably wouldn't surprise you that if you live in a rural area, the, per, the, the people have poor access to uh, family docs. Uh, but interestingly, people in Hamilton have much worse access to family docs than people in Toronto. So you're able to look at a fairly granular level, and again, that should drive policy. Uh, there's a huge uh, focus on something called choosing wisely in medicine these days, which is to say don't do tests that you don't need to do because they're expensive. And also don't do them because they often lead you to do other stuff that you shouldn't have done in the first place. And so this was going to be an example where they looked at people that had an annual health exam in Ontario and found that one in five had a test that they really shouldn't have gotten. And not only does that cost the system money, which is already broke, the people that had those tests had a bunch of more invasive tests that they didn't need either, which were even more expensive. And then to the mental health issue here, actually. Um, and I was just at a meeting with someone, the senior person in the ministry, a few days ago, and they, I didn't even know about this study, but they more or less mentioned it, because they said, did you know that about half of the visits to the emergency department by young folks, because of mental health reasons, you know, depression, um, anxiety, etc. That that they hadn't had a previous mental health contact within the healthcare system, and you could sort of say, well, all of those people just suddenly developed a mental health problem. I think what's more likely, to your point, is that a bunch of them may have well had a mental health problem that they may not come forward with, but probably many of them had a mental health problem and couldn't find anybody in the system to help them with that problem. My uh, sister-in-law is a, a nurse practitioner in a small uh, community um, near Guelph, and her biggest problem is when she has a kid who's suicidal, she can't get anybody to see the kid, other than to send the kid into emerge. There's just no, not enough support for young people with mental health issues. And it's studies documenting this that then, you know, it's not going to change policy overnight at all. Dan will tell you about that. But at least it raises the bar and gets people to start talking. And people can start to advocate for uh, people in the advocacy community can point to this study as well and go to policymakers and say, you know, you should be focusing on that. So um, I'm going to turn it over to the mighty Dan um, to um, really just sort of take us through um, a, a more specific topic, which is around uh, opioid. Thanks, Andreas. What Andreas didn't say is that he beats me every single time. Of <laughs> you beat me once. It's generous. <laughs> um, 
So starting off, I think it's really useful to, to just uh, talk about a few things that Andreas left us with. The first was this idea of choosing wisely and um, doctors being in a position to uh, basically improve their practice. And this uh, has a lot of overlap with the opioid crisis as we see it now. The other thing I think which is a perfect segue is this idea of um, undocumented uh, mental illness among young people, which uh, there uh, we see lots of overlap with, and I'll touch on a little bit. So before I start, though, I think it's, it's I'm, I'm going to give a, sort of a very broad overview of the opioid crisis. This is really an introduction more than anything. I'm going to paint a picture using health systems data um, to demonstrate um, the trends that have brought us to where we are with the opioid crisis. Uh, and sort of dig in a little bit to see what some of the potential causes are. But before I start, does anybody out there, uh, not to put anyone on the spot, have any ideas about what you've seen in the media or heard from people about what, why now there are so many people dying of opioid overdose? Yeah? Rise of fentanyl. Rise of fentanyl, okay. That's great. Yeah? What's that? Overprescription of opioids. Yes, okay. Can you repeat that again? Overprescription, so we heard rise of fentanyl, which is a really highly potent um, type of opioid, and the other was overprescription of opioids. Anything else? So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so that, that's a really good starting point for this discussion. Um, and you know, I think what's clear is there's so much information out there. You start looking at the headlines and they can be really overwhelming. And all you see with the headlines is, you know, people are dying, the reason they're dying is because of opioids. And it's sometimes tough to start teasing apart all the information that you see. But once you do, it's, you know, if you can sort of see the trees for the forest, um, you start to see some trends out there. So, you know, you look at the bottom right here. Opioid deaths declined in 2012, uh, says Bloomberg Business in the U.S. Um, but fatal heroin overdoses almost doubled uh, prior to that. Um, you know, on the top right, the Boston Globe, surge in heroin overdoses puzzles health workers. Um, and then this uh, Florida, the one in the middle here, heroin overdoses spike after Florida cracks down on prescription pill abuse. So you know, there's there's these these storylines that are out there, and I think you know, lots of them. If we start looking at the health systems data that we have, we can start teasing apart what we're seeing. So um, this is some information from the U.S. Uh, this is data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and as you can see, starting from the 1980s, um, really there's been this increase. If you look to the right side. Uh, there's been this steady increase in the number of drug overdose deaths. Um, so when we talk about things like the rise of fentanyl, when we talk about um, you know, new scary drugs that are on the market, I think it's important to remember that a lot of these trends, uh, while really you know, it's clear that we're at the probably, hopefully, uh, at the apex of this crisis, that this has been building for, for quite some time. And if you look to the left, um, you know, definitely one of the reasons that we're seeing, uh, uh, potentially one of the reasons that we're seeing uh, an increase in, in overdose deaths right now is a change in the market. So uh, we're seeing a shift in uh, fent uh, the deaths related to heroin and fentanyl versus other opioids like hydrocodone or oxycodone. And here, I think one thing that um, health systems data can help us with, but one way in which it's limited, is that when we think about opioid deaths, particularly when governments, I think, think about them, uh, there's this notion that there are a bunch of distinct markets for drugs uh, in our country. So you've got the prescription market, which is distinct from the illegal drug market, which is, dis which is distinct from regulated market for drugs like alcohol and tobacco and cannabis starting next year. 
But what I think you know, the data on the left here shows is that really, and, and what I think the opioid overdose crisis sort of writ large demonstrates, is that we can't be thinking about these drug markets as distinct. These are overlapping drug markets, and we're seeing people shifting from accessing drugs through the pharmaceutical market, through the prescription drug market, and then moving to a gray market, maybe, of um, pharmaceuticals that have been diverted from that market, and then to illegal drugs like heroin. Now, at the same time, I would also caution that it's not captured in these data, but it's very likely that, uh, if not the majority, a large number of these overdose deaths also uh, include alcohol. So this notion that you know people are dying of opioids, the opioids are coming, say, from just the illegal market, and that's it, um, is, is not uh, reflective, I think, of the reality of the situation, which is really that we're seeing this dynamic movement between the prescription market, regulated substances like alcohol, and, um, and illegal drugs like heroin. Now, what's pretty uh, galling about this, and um, you know, going way back here, but you know, it seems like there are these ongoing epidemics that really impact people who are often marginalized, who are stigmatized for some reason, and who are made vulnerable and aren't necessarily able to access health services. Um, and in the 90s, um, you know, this set of vulnerabilities manifested for a lot of people in uh, HIV infection. Um, so there was, you know, a massive HIV epidemic in Canada, uh, in the United States, and a bunch of other places, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, that started, or that sort of um, rose sharply in the 90s. Um, but what we're seeing now, which is just uh, colossally bad, is that the number of opioid deaths in North America that we're seeing in 2015 are higher than all. Um, you know, the higher than the worst years of the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, in 1995. And a lot of it, well, some of it is certainly driven by an increasing uh, number of young people who are uh, being uh, diagnosed with opioid use disorders. So, um, as you can see here, um, the number of youth, particularly in the 18 to 20 and the 21 to 25 um, bracket, uh, there's a sharp increase, six-fold increase. This is, again, from uh, the US. Um, but I think a lot of these numbers mirror the experience in Canada. It's been a six-fold increase uh, from, uh, you know, basically over the last 15 years. And what's crazy about this is that even though the numbers are just in the 18 to sort of 25 bracket, if you look at the, um, the line graph for all youth, those numbers are drawing up uh, the numbers for all youth. Um, and here's, I think, where there is a major gap if we're thinking about health systems research, particularly in Canada. There is a major gap in, I think, I mean, governments are terrible at programming for young people. Uh, and when it comes to drugs, would love to hear the kind of drug prevention and education programming you guys are getting, are getting these days. I suspect it's probably not that good. Um, there is just, uh, governments have been super weak at doing messages uh, and messaging uh, for young people around health, and particularly about, around drugs. To give you an example, there was an evaluation of anti-drug ads uh, that was done a few years back, and it found that uh, not only were anti-drug ads not effective, but that in some cases they actually increased the curiosity of people who saw them to using drugs. Because people would see images of drug use in these ads and think, oh, everybody's doing drugs. Like, why aren't I doing drugs? And that would, first of all, not reduce the number of people, or number of youth who um, would use drugs, but actually potentially increase their curiosity. So what does this um, 
led to? Well, here's um, you know some really useful data that uh, it was collected from um, Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences here in Ontario. And what you can see is th this is a chart showing different um, uh, the different proportion percentage of deaths attributable to opioids among young people uh, at different years. So the lowest, sort of lightest year, uh, gray bar is in 1992, the next one up is 2001, and the top one is 2010. And now the blurring headline here you can see, one in eight deaths, and probably now more, among young adults in Ontario is attributable to drug overdose. And it's been getting worse, as you can see, um, and overall, um, over the past, in, during this period between 1991 and 2010, when there was a massive increase in these deaths, over 5,000 Ontarians, Ontarians uh, died from opioid overdoses. So, what's been the response? Well, it's you know, governments are unwieldy, uh, as Andreas alluded to, uh, when it comes to drugs. While our health systems uh, are really increasingly well set up to identify the risk groups um, or the groups that are at highest risk of drug related problems, governments are slow to respond. And a lot of this relates to the ongoing stigmatizing of drug use among, uh, it, that, that is generally widespread. So this reduces the capacity of governments to implement programs uh, that can help save lives. So it's the supervised injection facility debate in um, Canada is a really good example. Um, does everybody know what a supervised injection facility is? So it's a, it's a facility where people who inject drugs, uh, so people who are injecting illegal drugs, can go and they can be provided with a medically supervised uh, safe space uh, where they can do their drugs using clean injecting equipment. So this uh, is a, was a really, really highly controversial intervention um, that emerged in Europe sort of in the late uh, 90s and uh, was implemented for the first time in North America in Vancouver in the early 2000s. Um, there's incredible evidence around the capacity of supervised injection facilities to not only basically halt people's uh, risk of uh, being infected with um, HIV or hepatitis C because the needles that everybody, uh, that people use when they visit these sites are sterile, but also um, dramatically reduce people's risk of, over, of overdosing because people, or of dying of overdose, because when people overdose at a supervised injection facility, there's medical personnel on hand to make sure that they but despite all this incredible evidence, we're only going to start seeing them next year in Toronto. Uh, and this is despite the fact that there's this, all this incredible and, in, and highly compelling uh, evidence to suggest that, you know, as, I, as we can see from this evidence, that there's so many people dying of overdoses. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, like everything, you just, it's worth highlighting the disconnect between what the research can tell you, where the evidence is around, around what works, and then how slow um, governments respond. Now, one way that governments and sort of the market responded was through a massive shift in the prescription opioid supply. And the gentleman over here was talking about fentanyl, um, and that's really been in the news because fentanyl, as I mentioned, is this really highly potent opioid. It's, I think, 100 times more potent than morphine, although the medical doctors in the room can probably tell me the exact uh, proportion. Um, so just to paint the picture here, there uh, is this company called Purdue Pharma. They uh, produce a, a formulation of, of opioid called OxyContin. And in the 1990s, it was marketed very, very aggressively to doctors. 
And one of the incredible innovations that Purdue Pharma produced was not only this pill that was exceptionally effective and well tolerated, that's OxyContin, but also a marketing innovation that they paired it with. And this marketing innovation was to say, okay, well the evidence suggests that um, you know, opioids are really useful for people dealing with cancer-related pain. So people uh, who have had surgeries or on chemotherapy who were dealing with the pains related to cancer and its treatment. However, the, uh, the market for cancer-related pain <coughs> is a tiny fraction of the overall market for all pain. And up until that point, opioids had generally been marketed only to medical providers, doctors, others, that um, treated cancer-related pain. And Purdue Pharma decided that with their new product, they would market it as a treatment for all pain. And this was a wild success and resulted in a massive, massive level of prescribing. And that's what someone, the gentleman over here, was talking about. So when we think about, and, and I, I think it's really worth highlighting that, and I know there's been increasing um, investigations about that. Purdue Pharma was successfully pursued in the United States for fraud uh, related to claim, its claims that um, OxyContin was uh, not, basically not very addictive. Uh, there were issues at the University of Toronto um, around the inclusion of a book for pain management uh, in a class uh, that was uh, being taught by someone who was on the Purdue Pharma Speakers Bureau list. So these issues uh, cut close to home. What I think is, is really worth highlighting is that, you know, overdose could not be a more personalized issue, right? It's something that happens to people and as I mentioned, the stigma remains really, really high around drug use, and particularly around um, drug-related problems like overdose. But we need to remember that so many of these issues are related to the overall um, structure of the ways that drugs are distributed through all of these markets, the pharmaceutical market, the legal market, the regulated market. Um, and that's where I think health systems research can can help sort of bridge that gap. Now, three months before its patent ran out, um, Ox, uh, Purdue Pharma removed OxyContin from the market. And um, this graph here uh, demonstrates what happened afterwards. So this is a graph demonstrating opioid prescriptions by month uh, in Ontario over the period of January 2010 uh, to um, mid-2015. And OxyContin, I'm sorry, it's a bit cut off at the bottom, but uh, you can guess which one is OxyContin, right? It's the uh, green uh, line graph that shoots uh, to basically zero uh, in 2012. <clears throat> at the time, Purdue Pharma uh, mar was marketing and producing a new drug called OxyNeo, which was a lot like OxyContin except it was claimed to be tamper resistant and also slower acting. So OxyNeo, which is the red line, was then introduced to the market. Now the problem is people didn't like it. So I think here what, what I think this demonstrates is that um, you know, when you disrupt a drug market, be it uh, in this case the pharmaceutical market, the ways in which that drug market are going to react are unpredictable and dynamic. So while governments and Purdue Pharma were hoping that people would, uh, patients would simply move from using OxyContin uh, to OxyNeo, what we actually saw was an increase in the prescribing of hydromorphone. Now, one caveat to that, so hydromorphone is the, um, or hydromorphon, uh, is the uh, is the purple graph? One ca caveat to that is that you know we see that there is this increase in hydromorphone prescribing going back until 2010. So just like 
you know, when you think about people describing the opioid overdose epidemic as being caused by fentanyl, um, we need to go back and think about that graph that I showed right at the beginning, sh demonstrating that the roots of this problem really go back at least three decades to the 1980s. And here, what's really interesting is that after, um, after the removal of Oxycontin from the market, we see this blue line, which is right in the middle there, uh, remain pretty much the same, and that's the level of prescribing for fentanyl. So, you know, when you start digging into some of this health <coughs> systems level data, it, it can often uh, raise new questions and, and help us distinguish um, between, you know, trends that might uh, seem obvious and those that aren't. In the interests of time, I'm going to skip forward a little bit and just, I, I, I just kind of want to bring this full circle um, back to this notion of disrupting drug markets. So I think it's really useful when governments think about how they're going to respond to crises around drugs. Um, you know, in the last, uh, you know, responding to the opioid overdose crisis, the, the notion was, okay, well, lots of people are getting um, addicted to OxyContin. There's lots and lots of uh, overdose deaths associated with the use of OxyContin. So let's reduce the supply of OxyContin. And of course, as we see here, that didn't really do much. We saw people shifting from the use of one type of opioid, OxyContin, to, uh, to other opioids. Now this is really similar um, in its effects to a lot of different kinds of interventions that have been undertaken by governments to reduce drug supply. So on the left, you've got um, an example of drug law enforcement, which is um, you know, still going strong. And then on the right, you've got uh, uh, an example of uh, aerial spraying of coca leaves in Colombia. And in the case of Colombia, the government of the US threw you know, billions and billions of dollars at the issue of coca leaf growing in Colombia, which, uh, which is then processed into cocaine. And the only thing that happened was that the geographic area in which coca leaf was grown expanded. So that's what they call the balloon effect, because when you poke a balloon, one part goes down, but the rest sort of builds up. And what I find really fascinating when you look at the systems research on the shift to other opioids after the removal of oxycontin, and when you look at the geographic shift, of coca leaf production to other areas after aerial spraying, it's almost identical in terms of the ways in which the market compensates by expanding in some ways. I think I'll leave it there. We only have five minutes left, and I wanted to leave some time for questions for Andreas and myself. Thank you.